Good morning. Uh, this morning's scripture is found in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14 on page number 857 in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And then the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Aaron. Good morning, everybody. So uh, it's Christmas. That's that time of year, right? And uh, the reason I know that is because um, people get trampled at Walmart and there's fistfights at Toys R Us. That's how we know now in modern America that this is happening. Uh, I have, my, my family will, will attest to this, I, I have this, um, this love-hate relationship with Christmas. I mean, and there's Honestly, there's just ways Christmas just bugs me, and um, maybe, maybe not what you think. Like, you're thinking, okay, he's a pastor, so he's bugged by all the materialism, commercialism, whatever you want to say, or he's bugged because, um, you know, he's not one of these, he doesn't like to talk about Santa Claus, thinks that's going to take away from Jesus. That's, that's really not what bugs me. What, what bugs me is far more selfish and far less biblical than that. Um, I, I'm bugged because every year I have to pull out like 85 boxes from the attic and, the, and, and, and I got I to gotta, you know, have my house be in shambles and packing paper all over the house for a week and dust flying up and all this. It just bugs me. It bugs me that uh, apparently Christmas food doesn't fit on traditional plates. You have to have Christmas plates that come out of the, you know, you got to take everything out of your pantry and put everything back in. And so, so every year I whine, I sigh, I do something that lets Michelle know that I'm not happy, that I have have to do this again, and uh, and Michelle just like you know you're screwed, just ruin Christmas and and uh, and so this year Michelle just like forget it, I'm gonna do it myself. I've heard your whining for 24 years now, and she's just like I'm gonna do it myself. So she did. She took everything out of the out of the you know the the, the garage, and everything, got it all ready, and and now people come over and they're like, hey, your house looks great, and Michelle's like, thank you, thank thanks for saying that, I appreciate that. Chris didn't help. Um, <laughs> So I had to think about this. Why does it bug me? Why, what, what is it about all this that bugs me? And maybe you, you feel the same way, maybe for be- better reasons than I do. And I decided what bugs me about Christmas is how complicated it makes my life. Okay, I told you, these are very selfish reasons. It's just, it's just, it just complicates everything, right? The malls are more complicated. I don't like malls anyways. And now, now they're, I mean, parking is more complicated. Um, Deciding who you're going to spend Christmas or Christmas Eve or, you know, is more complicated, especially if you come from a family where there's a divorce and you've got to now drive to four or five different homes and you make the rounds on on Christmas Day and Christmas Eve and the holidays. Uh, For some of you, that's a fight that you just sort of prepare to have every year because that's just the reality. I mean, it's just, it just becomes this complicated time. So I'll tell you what, let me give you a little advice. Do what we did early in our marriage. Decide now, uh, if you're dating and thinking you're going to be married, or if you're married, have this conversation today. Okay, from now on, where are we spending Christmas and New Year's and, and kind of create the holidays around yourself? So I asked Michelle to do this early in our marriage. I said, hey, babe, you, you figure it out. Let's, let's talk and you go back and figure out where are we gonna spend the holidays and you kind of divide them up and, and then let's do that. So she did and she came back and said, hey, here's what I came up with and I thought I'd show you this. Maybe this will help you. So for her family, we do all these, New Year's and Christmas and Easter and Memorial and July 4th and Labor Day and Thanksgiving. <laughs> So then she gave me my list, and, uh, and, and so here's what we get. Um, but but it's, a, it's a party at my house on Groundhog Day. So, um. uh, it, guys, ladies, let me tell you something about the guys in your life. Uh, it's complicated for us, okay, and there's a lot of reasons. Uh, but maybe one of the bigger reasons is... Um, at some point, you're going to go visit somebody probably on Christmas or Christmas Eve, and he's going to be driving maybe, and, and as you pull up in the driveway, he might take a deep sigh and look over at you and go, how long is this going to be, right? <laughs> how, how long 
do we have to stay? Okay, now, I, I know that sounds like he's being really a jerk. He's not. He's asking you a really honest question, and he needs you to answer him really honestly. Because here's why. He's thinking to himself, listen, if you tell me two hours, I'm gold for two hours. I'm, go I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to be the best behaved boy you can imagine. But if you tell me two, and that turns into five, I, I can't do this, right? I, I, I don't have I don't have that much niceness reserve in me to, to now like pull that up and try to, try to okay, we're still going. We're supposed to be gone four hours ago, right? I mean, so, so he's asking an honest question. Just tell him. Maybe it's six hours. Just tell him, and he will figure out a way to divvy up that happiness and all that over six hours and make it good for you, okay? So it's complicated for us, right? Um, it's complicated because it seems like every yes, year the, the list of who you're required to buy Christmas gifts for gets bigger and bigger, right? It's complicated because somebody is going to spend all day long in the kitchen preparing this incredible meal so that by the time you actually get that meal, you're so starved it takes you 75 seconds to inhale it and you're done, right? And chances are, unless you have a professional kitchen and 18 ovens, something's going to be on that table that is supposed to be warm and hot that's going to be cold, you know, like biscuits. Who wants that, right? And, and it's because, because we, we, we don't have that, right? It's, just, it's, it's complicated in every way. It's complicated for religious reasons, right? I mean, do I tell my, do I, do I celebrate Santa or are my kids going to grow up and hate Jesus? Do, do, I, do I, somebody told me that this is the, this is the you know, the Christians were, were co-opting the, the celebration of the ancient god Mithra. So that made Christmas evil. And, and then there's this whole new thing about social justice. And so I guess if I spend any money on somebody and I don't give it all away to build a water well in Africa, then I, I'm a terrible person at Christmas, right? So you, you've got all these competing things. And then some of you, this is supposed to be merry. We're, we're calling this this next four weeks joy to the world. We're going to talk about joy. And you're thinking, no, 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 that's not Christmas for me, right? It's supposed to be this happy family relational time. And it's the loneliest time in my life. It's a time of year when I'm most depressed. It's just complicated. And, and I think about that, and, and look, I'm not here to go, hey, here's five ways to make your Christmas less complicated. I, I, I don't know how to do that. If I did, I, I would, if you know, tell me. Um, that's not where we're going. I, I don't have any secret sauce related to that, but uh, you might still leave and be like me and whine and whatever, and your wife will call you Scrooge. But, but listen, in the midst of all this complexity, Right, all the complexness of Christmas, there's one thing that shouldn't be complicated, and that's the message of Christmas. It should not be complicated. It should be real easy. And if the message is complicated in your mind, then let me just take the blame. That's my fault. That's guys like me who stand up here. And, and so maybe you're one of those that, you know, it's a Christmas season, and so you, you go back to church, and then you'll come back at Easter. And, and that's cool. Just know we're open 52 weeks a year. Um, and, and, but but, but you, you come, and you're reminded why you don't go to church in the first place. It's so confusing. It's complicated. Whatever. We, we, guys like me complicate things. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I like it when people sort of just get to the bottom line. What's the essence of what I'm supposed to know? You go to a car dealer? I just want to know. You know, what do you want to know at a car dealer? I don't care about color. I don't care about your financing. Here's what I care about. What's the bottom? Just, just tell me the price, right? Just, can we just stop all this and just you tell me the lowest price and then I'll be done? I'll either buy it or I won't, right? So, so I want to know. I, don't, I, I want to know kind of just the simple bottom line. I'm a simple guy. I really am. And I hate it when things get complicated. I don't like going to restaurants where there's 8,500 things on the menu. Um, so that's why you come at Christmas to Foothill Church. Let me just tell you what you're not going to see. We're not going to have flying angels and live camels pooping in the aisle or whatever. We're, this is, this, we're simple. We're just not complicated, right? We, we're going we're gonna to sing. I'm going to preach. We're going to sing again. We're going to take communion, right? It's simple. But, 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 but more than that, I mean, there's, when you come to the Christmas story, there's so many things swirling around the story. There's Magi, whatever those are, right? These wise men, and there's Mary and Joseph, and you know, livestock, and and uh, shepherds, and star in the sky, and angels, and all these things, and all those are part of the story, but they're not the essence of the story, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Kind of, there's one piece of the Christmas story that I wanted to read to you this morning for the purpose of helping us understand what's at the bottom. What what is it that is the message of Christmas? And the angel says it in chapter 2, verse 10 that we read this morning. Okay, listen to it again. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. 
that shall be for all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. You see, at the heart of Christmas is good news. Just good news, right? The message of Christmas is really good news. That word good news, by the way, is where we get our word gospel. Gospel isn't a style of church. Gospel is not a style of music. Gospel is a word that means good news. And, 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 and so, so, listen, it's good news, and, and the angel says, for all people, right? Not just for Jews, not just for shepherds. Not just for rich people, not for people who are religious and got their act together. It's good news for all people, everyone, everywhere. See, stop here for a second and ask yourself the question, okay, do I look at Christmas? Is there anything about Christmas and Christianity, because the heart of Christmas is the heart of Christianity, that doesn't strike me as good news, right? And, and if you say, yeah, that, that's me, then then hear me, then you've been told the wrong message. You've heard the wrong message. Because, because look, someone's distorted it. If there is anything about the church, if there's anything about Christianity that doesn't feel like it carries the message of good news for you, then, then there's something wrong. Not with you, like, but what, what we've told you and, and, and how we've complicated it. See, look, if Michelle comes home and says to me, Chris... You're not going to be good news. Okay, now just put yourself in that situation. If I come, I've got great news for you. What, what, what's kind of going through your mind right now? What are you thinking? You're like, like oh, okay, wow. I want to hear this, right? Let me tell you what you're not thinking. You're not thinking, uh-oh, ever. You're not thinking in your mind, uh, what's, okay, all right, I'm on my guard. Michelle, what are you about to tell me? What's this going to cost me? Right? Good news! We can remodel the kitchen for $80,000. How's that good news? <laughs> right? Good news! You get to clean a garage. How's that? Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. You need to preface that another way, right? That is not good news of great joy. That's like, that stinks, and I don't want to hear that. Okay, so, 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 so see, this is what I'm saying. I know what doesn't cross your mind, what doesn't cross my mind when I hear good news is, is what do I have to do? What's this going to cost me? That's not good news. Good news is the war is over. Yes, right? Good news is Johnny's coming home for Christmas. Yes, good news is your school debt has been paid off. That's good news, right? Good news is your mortgage is over. It's done. Somebody paid it for you. Holy cow, that's Great news. Good news is everybody gets bonuses and raises this year. That's really good news, right? That's how we think of good news. So, so <laughs> when the story of Christmas began, the first words on Christmas morning of announcing this, right? And I love this. Here, the angel lights up the sky, right? This host of angels. I mean, it was just thousands, hundreds of thousands, just boom, lights up the sky. The first words are amazing to me, pretty ironic. Fear not. Oh, oh okay, because I see this all the time. <laughs> this is great. No, no problem, right? The angel goes, fear not, for I bring you Good news. Some, some translations say glad tidings, right? Good news to you. And that's what's at the heart of, of, of Christmas. That's what's at the heart of Christianity. See, if the message of Christmas, as you go into this season, isn't 100% good news, if the message of the gospel that the church preaches is not 100% good news to you, something's wrong. And if you feel differently about Christmas, about the church... Maybe it's because somebody's complicated the story for you. I just want to uncomplicate it for you. Okay? Like, look, let me say it this way. I'm going to surprise some of you, but let me, let me say it this way. If, if it's an announcement of good news and what you don't expect to hear, what you expect to hear is really good news, let me, let me show you how it's, it's not good news what most of you think of when you think of Christianity, what most of you think of when you think of, of maybe Christmas, he, here's what's not happening. It's the good news is not behave better. Good news! You have to clean up your act. Okay, huh? Right? That's every religion in the world. 
That's every religion in the world that says, you better get better, right? Good news, light up the sky, do better. Okay, I'm not feeling that right now. Okay, good news, how about this one? It's not read your Bible, pray, and go to church. Now, I think all those things are great things. But it's not that. It's not, this is, you know, good news, you have to read your Bible every day. What? And how about this one? It's not give your life to God. Now, now, now look, what's that saying? God, I'll, I'll come to you. I, I, you're saying good news, and now you're requiring something of me. No, he's saying good news. I want to tell you something. I want you to know something. I, I want you to embrace a truth that I'm about to tell you. And he says the Savior is born. So look at all these things that I've told you. It's not that they're bad things, but they're not the good news. They're all demands. They're, 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 see, and yet, yet many of you think this is what the message of Christianity is. But the problem is the angel couldn't stand up there, light up the sky, go, good news of great joy, do this. No, no, no. Because the story of the gospel is good news. So I want to explain to you that message. I want to just kind of get down to the essence of why in the world are, are, can, can, can the angel, can we say, can we celebrate this time of year as really, really, really good news. Now, the way I want to do that is I want to, I want to talk to you about this, this guy named John wrote several of the books in your New Testament, right? So, so he writes the Gospel of John, and he writes the letters of John towards the end, and he writes the Revelation of John, and, uh, and, and here he was. He, he, here's who he was. Jo- John was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, right? And he walked with Jesus, and he was there his entire ministry. But among that 12, John was one of these three insiders that Jesus kind of, he discipled them all, but then he took three aside, and he really invested in these guys that were going to carry the ball and, and pour it into their lives and let them see and experience things that the other guys didn't experience all the time. And in fact, John says, he describes himself in the Gospel of John as the disciple that Jesus loved. He was, this, he was this great friend of Jesus. And history tells us, uh, well, the, 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 the writers of Scripture tell us that when, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, he looks down at John and he says, John, and he looks at Mary and he says, John, behold your mother. And he looks at Mary, Jesus' mother, and says, Mary, behold your son. And history tells us that John actually took that very seriously. He took Mary away and they lived in Ephesus. And you can go to Ephesus in, ancient, or in, in modern day Turkey today and you can, they'll show you a house that they believe was uh, was inhabited by, by John and Mary as he took care of her until she died. And here's John. And John has all these experiences, and he's, he's going to die, and he realizes, you know what, I, before I die, I, I want people to know the good news of Jesus Christ. I want them to know about who this man was. And so he sits down and he starts writing about, about this man. And, and he tells us late in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, he says, I'm writing these things so that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he says this, he says, I, I, I suppose if everything was written that could be written, the, all the books in the world couldn't contain what we could say about Jesus. And so he tells us certain stories. And one of those stories that he tells us is a story about a time that Jesus interacted with this religious leader by the name of Nicodemus. And and Nicodemus has these questions, you know, how how, how can I be saved? And how how can, you know, Jesus is talking about being born again. Nicodemus is like, what, what? how do you get born? How does a man enter his mother's womb again? And he's like, Nicodemus, don't you understand that, that, you know, you're a teacher of the law and you don't get this stuff? And and, and there's all this back and forth between this, between Jesus talking and, and, uh, and, and Nicodemus talking. And, and at some point in this story, John, it's like he, he's telling the story and he decides, I just got to get the punchline here. I, I got to tell you what's going on. And so there's this point where it's almost like he, he lays down his pen as the narrator of, of this conversation and he zooms out and says, I'm going to give you the moral of the story. I'm going to tell you now about this man, Jesus. I can't wait till the end to to give you the punchline. And so right in the middle of this conversation, he tells us and he writes what is perhaps his most famous line in Scripture and perhaps arguably the most famous line in all of the New Testament. And it is the heart of Christmas. And see, listen... um, I'm going to guess most of you have heard this passage, and if you haven't heard it, that's okay. You've most likely seen it, you know, at a sporting event being held up by a rainbow-haired man, right, or something. But it is the essence of the good news. So, so here's what I want to do. See, if, you, if you're not a Christian this morning, 
and you don't want to be, you're like, I, I reject that thing, you know, I just kind of want to keep doing what I'm doing, you can do that. But before you make that decision, I just want to make sure you're making an informed decision. You're not basing it off of some weird, complicated version of Christianity. It's, it's the essence. It's the simple message of the gospel. I, I want to make sure you're there, right? I don't want you rejecting some complicated, I'm not even sure what that means, or rejecting some false notion of what it means. I want you to reject the real good news if you're going to reject anything, okay? And so if you go to John 3, 16, I want, to hear, I want you to hear the good news. And most, a lot of you say, you, you have this memorized, okay? If you want to look at it with me, it's on page 888 of the Bibles in your chairs. And listen to what John writes. Okay, John sits down, he sort of zeroes, comes back out. And by the way, I've got a red letter edition, and red letters usually mean Jesus spoke this. And in my translation, they're putting these words on Jesus' lips. I don't think that's what's happening. I think this is John writing. I think this is John backing up. I think it'd be weird for, for him to talk about, you know, he sent his only son, and he's talking about himself. God did not send his son into the world. I mean, all that. I think this is John giving us an editorial comment. So he sits down and goes, okay, I want to I say something really crucial here. And he writes, for God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave. God's love was so large, so loved. It was so big, so magnanimous that it resulted in giving. Now, you have to understand, maybe you've heard that verse a million times and it doesn't sink in the way it would have to John's original audience. No one talked about God like this. In fact, if you were a Roman, okay, or in, you lived in ancient Greece, you understood there was this pantheon of gods, right? Zeus, and, you know, reinterpreted as Jupiter, and Diana, or, or you know, all these different gods sort of inhabited the heavens, and gods did not love anyone. They played with people. Right? They, they toyed with you, they, they, they required, they demanded of you, they never gave to people. And so there's actually this saying in, in ancient Rome that said the gods played and the people paid. That's how they viewed God. And John sits down and goes, no, God, this God, he's not, you're not a pawn. He's not just using you for entertainment. He's not a, you're not a tool for his own ends. John sits down and writes, God so loved that he gave. His love resulted in giving. And he overflowed in giving. Not taking. Not saying I require. This, what, it's giving. So he says, for God so loved the world, and then look, look at it, that he gave what? His only son. Like Jesus didn't look, God didn't look around heaven and go, you know what, poor creatures. Um, what, guys, what do we have left over up here? What can I give them? What can I throw down? Kind of throw them a bone. He gave his only son. His, his most precious. I don't have another one of these lying around. This is my son. This is my eternal son. This is a son that I've had relationship with for eternity. And I'm giving him to you. And you're going to kill him. And he's going to die for you. And this is what I'm doing. I'm giving this son to you. My most precious possession. I'm not sending you an angel. i got millions of those. I'm not going to raise Titan from the deep, right? I'm giving you my son. My most precious possession to come to you. I so loved that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, whoever, whoever believes, right? There it is again. The angel says, this is good news for all people. John says it again, says, look, this is for whoever. The offer is out there for all. The good news is not limited to religious people. It's not limited to, you know, moral people. It's not limited to people of a certain class. It's not limited to people of a certain intelligence, a certain gender, a certain political party, whatever. It's whoever, whoever, but whoever what? Whoever believes in him. Now, this is interesting. Now, follow me here. I'm not trying to get all technical on you, but I want you to hear this because this is, this is pretty amazing. So John to Santa goes, okay, for God so loved the world that he gave. Yes, that whoever, what? What? What do I say here? Because here's his trouble. John, John uses some of the most, if you, if you ever study Greek, some of you guys are at APU in a certain place where, where you're learning Greek, and you're gonna, they're, they're going to put you into the book of John because the book of John has the simplest Greek in probably all the New Testament. Very easy to read as a beginning student. 
And he's going to use a word for believe, pistuo, that is very common in the, uh, in the Greek language. Okay, now, now follow me here, because he, 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 he starts to go, you know, that whoever, now how do I say this? Because if I just say believes, I'm going to really mischaracterize what's happening here. Because I can believe in a lot of things. I can, I can believe in a president. I can believe in Santa Claus. I can believe in lots of, you know, we say we believe. We throw that word around. So John does something that most scholars believe had never been done before in the history of the Greek language. He adds this little prepositional, or this little preposition to the end. It's the word in Greek, ice. And it means whoever believes into. He could have used another word, by the way. En, which just means in. He used believes ice, pistuo ice. Whoever believes into. This is a radical new concept. This is a concept that says whoever, whoever, you know, moves toward, whoever, it's this idea of believing towards something. It's in the Greek, there was no word for trust. So John invents a term and says this, yes, that's it. Believes into, leans toward, right? Puts trust in. So when we ask, what does God require of the world, right, in response to what he has done in Christ, John says, trust. John says, trust in, lean toward, believe in. Into not just I believe merely in something. I believe in the stock market. I believe in Santa Claus. I believe no. It's believe into. Now let me tell you how that works. Like 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 I, 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 here's a chair. Right here's a stool. And I could say I could say I, I could talk about this stool. I could spend my life studying stools. I could go. I like stools. I I I, I prefer stools over other forms of chairs. Right. We could do all kinds of things. Okay. I believe. In that stool. That's not what John's talking about. Believe into, believe towards, trust is, is when I, I get into it and I put my weight on it. Right? Like, like, this is not believe into. This is not believe into. It's me and the chair, right? Because I'm not sure this chair, a little sketchy, so... I'll lean a bit on myself. No, it's, it's here it is. I'm in. I believe in this thing, right? I really believe in this thing, <laughs> right? I trust it, right? So when you came in this morning, you didn't think about it, did you? Just sat down. <laughs> I believe in this thing. I, I trust. Nobody in here was worried. I'm not sure this thing's going to carry me. And you, I don't see any of you sort of hanging off just, just in case, you put it all in. I believe in this thing. That, that's, this is this radical concept that in the Greek language they didn't know anything about before that. So he says, whoever, God so loved the world that he gave that whoever believes into, not just apart from, will not perish but have eternal life. See, this is what happens. For those who place their trust in, right, get in the chair. This is not a promise for people who merely believe things about that chair. I believe that chair is black. I believe that chair is relatively tall. I believe that chair is covered with some kind of leatherel material, whatever, right? Um, I believe, it's not I believe about. I mean, I believe in, right? It's not people who just say, well, I love Jesus. It's saying, no, 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 no. I'm showing that I love Jesus. I trust in him. I believe unto, into, toward, I'm in. That, that, that's what's happening. And people that do that, John says, you'll never die. Now, let me explain that. I told you this is all good news, but you know what? What makes it such radically good news is there really is, there's some bad news underneath it. And that is this, that if you won't do this, then then you'll perish. And perishing, according to John and according to other writers of Scripture, is not merely I die and decay and, you know, kind of get... You know, life to life and whatever, we, 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 we sort of get absorbed into the, the ground. No, no, no. 
John's going to talk about it in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, that if you die outside of Christ, instead of eternal life, you get what he calls the second death. He calls it the lake of fire. We, we call it hell. Okay, and, and ju- just so you know, <laughs> right, you're like, oh yeah, hell's where all the, all the bad boys that go down there and they party with their friends and they're drinking, right, we're having a good time. You want to drink wine? You're going to have to go to heaven for that. There's going to be no alcohol in hell. I know that's not very Christmassy, but it's true. <laughs> okay? Okay, but here's the good news. Those who believe into, right, will have eternal life. <laughs> and here again, I want to clear up this misconception because some of you, like, you go, eternal life. Okay, I know what that is. I've seen the movies and eternal life, that's heaven. And what heaven is, is this sort of out-of-body existence. Apparently, we all sort of get a, 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 a uniform that we wear, and it's a robe, and they all look the same. And, and over eternity, my hair is going to grow real long, and I'm going to be handed a harp and expected to play that on a pillowy cloud forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. How is that good news for anyone? I don't want to go to heaven like that. <laughs> right? No, no, no. So what is eternal life? What is eternal life? John later on tells us, John 17, 3. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is this. It is a fundamental change in relationship between you and God. I'm not, I'm not saying there's no heaven. I'm saying heaven isn't that weird billowy cloud thing. I'm saying, but there is a, it is a, is a relationship of knowing God, knowing Jesus, being known by God, being known by Jesus. And it's not just transferring you from, you know, one census box to another, right? I don't just go from, like, well, I go in the non-Christian category right now. Now I'm over in the Christian category. I go from the Democrat to Republican or whatever. We're not just switching parties. We're not just switching categories. It is a change in relationship. A radical change in God's relationship with you. In fact, back in John chapter 1, verse 12, he says this. To all who did, he said he came into his own, and his own didn't receive him. But to all who did receive him, to them he gave, who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become, what's that, children of God. Maybe you've heard people at Christmas time or whatever, they'll, they'll sing or they'll speak about you know, the brotherhood of mankind, okay, we're all men, so I guess in that sense we're all, you know, brothers and sisters in, in the sense that we share humanity, and we're all children of God. No, we are not. No, no. the Bible, John, I'll show you another one here in a minute, says the only people that are children of God are people who received him, who believed on his name. See, so, 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 so you're a child of God. So, and look at what that, put that verse back up, John 1, 12, and look at this. It says, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. How do you receive? You believe in two, right? How do you, how do you uh, receive? You believe in two. How do you believe? You, you receive. So these are back and forth, right? What, what does receiving look like? It looks like believing, trusting in, leaning towards, getting in the chair, Now, Paul, another writer of Scripture, wrote wrote most of your New Testament. He he picks up on this idea of children in Romans, this this book that he writes, basically the greatest letter ever written. And listen to this. He he says this, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, listen to this, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. God our Father, Christ our brother, provided we suffer with him, just like Christ did, in order that we may be glorified him, just like Christ was. Now that's amazing. This is in Scripture, by the way. If you don't read Scripture, you ought to, because there's some really incredible things in here, and you ought to make it a habit of looking at what the Bible says. Because look, what he's saying is if we believe, trust, lean into, get in the chair, and we believe in Jesus, he says right then, you become a child of God. And, and, And as a child, Paul says, now you are an heir to the things of God. An heir to God. I mean, just, just, just try to wrap your mind around that. An heir with Christ. 
Like somebody, you got a letter in the mail today that, you know, wasn't from this prince of Nigeria that's claiming if you'll just put, give him your social security number. I'm saying if, if you got a letter, a legitimate letter, you know, stamped everything that said you are an heir to the throne of England, whatever. I, oh, oh my gosh, I, I am rich beyond my imagination. I cannot believe this. And Paul says, when you believe into, you become a child of God, an heir with Christ. I now don't have an inheritance waiting for me that's just going to pass away with this earth. I have this eternal inheritance that's going to blow my mind because it's coming from the one who made everything, who owns everything, who holds everything. It's all his. This is going to be unbelievable. You see this? So, 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 so God loved so he gave we believe and so we receive that's it no, write that down right god loved and so he gave we believe and so we receive that's it now tell me how how is that bad news i mean even if you say i don't believe it okay fine you don't believe it but you still can't call it bad news Right? It's pretty incredible that God offer, offers us a chance to become children of God. That's the good news of great joy for all people, even for you, even for me. This is why it's so uncomplicated. It's just great news. And if you're not convinced, you've been burned by the church, whatever, you know, things, I don't get this, and church is so judgmental or whatever. Okay, well, let me, let me show you another comment. Go back to John 3.16. I want to show you one more thing. And, 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 and John isn't done editorializing yet. He's going to give us another comment. Now, most of us know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that if he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, you know, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, as the King James Version says. What many of us don't know is John 3.17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order... That the world might be saved through him. You know what condemnation is? P please don't confuse some things in your mind. Condemnation is this. You have no hope. You're condemned. It's, it's over. We know God brought the Spirit into the world to convict the world of sin. Conviction is a wonderful thing. Don't, don't ever think... Don't ever, don't ever think that somehow, it's, it'd, be like, it'd be like a doctor saying to you, um, A, there's no hope, so just go home and die. Or, let me tell you what your problem is. You have this kind of cancer, and if we can get radical with this, we can get it out of there. See, that's good news to you. That's really good news for you to understand that. That's not bad news. You see what I'm saying? So, so, so don't, don't confuse this. But listen, if you ever felt condemned by Christians, if you ever felt condemned by the church, then you heard the wrong message. Right? That, that's not your fault. Like Because John, who knew Jesus as good as anyone, decides, i got to write this down. i got to get this out. Here's the message you need to know. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to offer the world an opportunity to be saved. Don't confuse condemn, condemnation with conviction. Don't, don't confuse condemnation with a requirement that you just have to admit you're sick in order for the doctor to even treat you. Or you won't go to the doctor. Don't convince, don't, 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 don't you know, wrap up and get confused by, by condemnation being, being, I'm required to be humble. That's why I came to shepherds. It's good news, great joy, a Savior. Remember you've been waiting for him? It's Christ the Lord. Go get him. See, God didn't come to shake his finger in your face and thump your chest and say, you suck, you'll never make it, you, are, you have no hope. That's not the God of the Bible. You know who Jesus did that to? Religious people. <laughs> 
religious people, right, who go, you know, I, I'm good enough. I'm really good. I'm so good, in fact, God ought to be really proud. Oh, you're coming to heaven? Good Lord, this is awesome. Because, man, we need more like you. And Jesus said, never. No, no, no. What he wants is, is people that go, I need Jesus. I need to be rescued. I realize I realize something's going on. I realize there's brokenness in me. And Jesus is like, it's okay. Hey, hey, hey. I don't want you to clean up your brokenness. I want you to come to me. This is the good news, right? Not good news. Clean up and then we'll talk. Good news. I love that. I'm not waiting for version 2.0 to roll off the shelf. I want you right there. Come. Let me take you where you are. Isn't that good news? See, that is really, really good news. That's why we sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Praise God. Now look, uh, musicians, you can come up, but listen. Listen. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. Okay, and I, and, I, and, and, and I want you to remember, God so loved that he gave. You believe and you receive. See, I, I can't make anyone believe. I don't want to make anyone believe. I'd love it if you'd believe. I'd love if the Holy Spirit would open your eyes and you would believe. You either believe or you don't. Okay? I can't do that. That's a work of God in your heart, in your life. But listen, if you don't, if you walk out of here and go, no, I reject that. I don't, I don't believe that. Here's all I want you. Will you at least do this? Will you take it with you? Will you take it with you and keep it stored? And maybe next week, maybe next month, Maybe next year, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, but sometime before your last breath on this earth, will you remember that Jesus, <laughs> this good news is offered to you. And this good news is for you to grab hold of wherever and whenever. And it's for whoever. Okay? And so, so before you take that breath, I pray that you will believe. I pray you'll believe today. I mean, genuinely believe. Believe in too. Not, not kind of half in, half out. Not, I like chairs. I like Jesus. I mean, I believe that Jesus will take care of my problem. I believe that he will solve it. I believe that he will put me in a relationship with God. If you'll do that so that you, you might know eternal life, you might know the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, and that by knowing you would be saved. You trust in what he's done for you to save you. I pray that happens. And if it doesn't happen today, it happens some point where you'd say, I finally believe and I'm saved. Let's pray.